Hello, everyone. I would like to give you all a very well, warm welcome to the today's webinar on extension advisory services at the front line of the COVID-19 response for resilient and sustainable food systems in Europe and Central Asia. My name is uh, Sofia Kristina Mrocek, and I'm an extension and advisory specialist at FAO, Rome. And before we officially start the webinar, I would just like to walk you through a couple of technical um, features of this webinar. So to start, we have uh, interpretation in English and Russian available. To pick the language of your preference, you can just go to the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. You can click on it and then choose the language of your preference. For all the panelists, I would just like to remember to switch off the interpretation every time you speak, and then you can go back to uh, Russian or English as you prefer. Uh, we have also a chat box on the right hand of your screen where you are very warmly invited to share your thoughts, reflections, and also flag any technical issues, for example, with the sound or video. At the bottom uh, of your screen, you can also see the Q&A icon where you can ask questions to the presenters. We would also like to ask you if you can uh, type as well the name of the presenter or the country so we know to whom you would like to direct your question, which would make the facilitation uh, easier. Uh, we also have our colleague Jana who will be translating questions into Russian. So if you prefer to write in Russian, please uh, do not hesitate to do it. Uh, this webinar is also uh, live streamed on YouTube and our colleague Andrew Fieldsend, who is uh, with us also, will be um, taking the questions and facilitating this discussion on YouTube. So now let's see the quick preview of uh, our webinar. Okay, uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Raimund Tiele to give uh, official opening remarks. And Raimund Tiele is the regional program leader for FAO Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia, as well as representative of FAO in Albania, Armenia, Georgia, and Moldova. So Raimund, over to you. Thank you, uh, Sofia, and uh, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen, or good afternoon, depending uh, which time zone of Europe and in the world you are with this, um, let's say, Zoom webinars, we are becoming also global, which uh, I think is very good. So um, thank you very much uh, for being with us. And I would really also like to warmly welcome you on behalf of uh, the regional office for Europe and Central Asia uh, to this COVID-19 um, webinar in, in the region. Actually, it's the second webinar um, we are already organizing within uh, the COVID uh, series. And um, as Shafia was already saying, it's not just a Zoom meeting, but it's also really live on YouTube. And we are very much looking forward uh, to uh, spend the next 19 minutes um, in this uh, discussion uh, with you and to listen also to interesting um, uh, inputs, uh, both, of course, from the panelists, but uh, uh, also from you as an audience. It's also the second session in a series of webinars organized in collaboration with the Regional Network of Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services to discuss the role of extension and advisory services in the context of the uh, pandemic in the different region. Uh, the first of this series was uh, focusing also on Asia. We have um, experienced an unprecedented situation in the past months, how the countries have been affected by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, 
both from a health as well as also from an economic perspective. And interestingly, I think is we do not speak yet about the environmental issues. I mean, we are probably also, um, and this might be subject of another discussion, we may also need to uh, talk more about environmental aspects later on, but that's uh, of course not subject of today's um, focus. I think um, it's crucial uh, still to learn from each other regarding the adequate measures to be applied in the countries. We are still in a situation where we have seen um, many, uh, let's say, policy measures uh, have been already taken, but I think we are still learning in the agriculture and in the food sector, what are uh, the implications, uh, not only from a short term, but uh, of course also from a long term perspective. Considering this, um, FAO plays a key role in providing a platform for information sharing amongst the experts, amongst uh, the countries, through the facilitation of a multi stakeholder dialogue in the region. And I, I think. The important point of these webinars we are doing currently is really facilitating this multi-stakeholder dialogue in the region. Because the impact of the COVID pandemic has shown that the food value chains can be affected. But we have certainly also seen that maybe some of the predictions did in our region not uh, fully uh, come through. Governments in the regions are confronted with the challenge to respond to the health crisis because uh, the pandemic is uh, first and foremost is a health crisis, but at the same time, ensuring also sufficient food supplies and the functioning of the services for all and particularly also for the vulnerable uh, people um, in need. The lockdown measures also showed that um, the delivery of services to farmers became from one day to the other a challenge. Uh, the extension service, the extension agents were not easily going um, out to the field in order to be able to keep also the social distance. So it showed that there is a need for making also the extension services resilient for such challenges. And it may also require a changing in how services are delivered. On the other hand, the extension services are also key in making farmers more resilient and allowing them also to adapt to such challenges. I think it's important that the rural producers have relevant and accurate information um, related to inputs and services in order to support the agricultural production, strengthen the local value chains, both during and the post emergency period. The impact of COVID-19 and response measures are not uniform even in our region. I mean, we have European uh, Union countries which require um, a very different approach uh, related to also, or in contrast to other countries of the Caucasus or also uh, Central Asia. So I think it's important that farmers need advice, not only on technology, but also on marketing and financial management, which becomes even more crucial in light of the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, let me bring, in this case, also an example from Central Asia. Farmers in Kyrgyzstan had really serious problems before COVID-19 already. They faced limited resources for assuring veterinary and phytosanitary um, safety standards, outdated technologies, limited access to science-based knowledge and techniques, and outdated and inconsistent also uh, legal framework. The constraints are in accessing also credits. And we have seen in the recent surveys that particularly the financial access is something which is going to become more and more uh, problematic. So considering that the areas uh, which I've just also mentioned are affected by the implications of the lockdown measures and other impacts on COVID-19, these problems could have been exacerbated and the need for advice ex and extension services could have been uh, also increased recently. So agriculture extension and advisory services provide, um, in, in fact, um, are, uh, provide um, a, an opportunity to um, face and to support the challenges or in adapting their activities uh, to the necessities of this area. 
So to be efficient, effective, and market-oriented and inclusive to the smallholders. The smallholders are the one who are very much rely need to rely on uh, these services in order to be able uh, to um, support uh, the necessary transformation, uh, taking also in account the digitalization and sustainable food systems and not limit themselves only to production and technology transfer. It's needed to improve the governance and explore synergies of the pluralistic actors that will help innovations to happen faster and scale up it easily. So the regional office uh, with also the regional in initiative on empowering smallholders has uh, studied uh, the status and the implementation of uh, country programs um, that assist the reform process in the national um, extension and agriculture service uh, systems in the different parts of the region. And um, I think this is an important piece of information in order uh, to contribute to that. But I will not uh, like to take more of your time. I'm very happy to welcome you and I see already 266 participants uh, on this um, in webinar uh, site. So we're looking very much forward to uh, the discussion and sharing of the information and really a lively debate. So thank you very much for your attention and um, all the best for this discussion. Over to you, Sofia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raymond. I would just like to say that it's also great to see that we have a very differentiated uh, geographical presence in the room. We have uh, colleagues connecting from all the region, uh, different parts of Europe, different parts of Asia, and also even some Asia Pacific, Americas and Asia uh, and Africa. This is uh, really great. Uh, similar for the different types of stakeholders. We have a lot of colleagues from international organizations, academia, um, producer organizations, and uh, also, of course, extension advisory services. So this is uh, very, very good. And before we hear from about concrete country experiences, we thought that it is important to set a little bit the scenes, because as Raymond said, um, the impact of COVID-19 is uh, not uniform, even within one region. It really depends on the countries. We have different impacts on different sectors and different producer groups. And we have different extension advisory services actors who have also different roles and challenges. So I would like to now invite Pedro Arias, who is the economist uh, from uh, FAO Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia, to talk a little bit more what is happening right now in the region, in Europe and Central Asia, how COVID-19 impacts the region. Over to you, Pedro. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, we'll do our best to give you an overview of the situation uh, of uh, value chains, uh, food supply chains in Eurasia, the problems that we have observed and the problems that are about to come. Um, we have a, a survey that we conduct, uh, conducted weekly at the start of the, of the lockdown and we are doing now every two weeks of about 500, uh, 500 key informants who are telling us uh, problems along the, the supply chain. Uh, from input suppliers, farmers, retailers, wholesalers, pro food processors. And uh, what they're telling us is that the situation is evolving, it's not over yet, uh, that uh, we, saw, we saw different stages of uh, impact of the pandemic in different countries. We saw similar patterns, we saw some chain reactions, and the news is that we're also seeing improvements. Um, the early impacts of the pandemic included farmers, export-oriented, high-value-added uh, producers for restaurants and, and uh, um, high-value outlets related to tourism and so on. Uh, then smallholders uh, also were impacted by the of farm income earnings uh, because of the restrictions on mobility. There was a moment of panic for manufacturers related to the storage. Um, 
if the situation lasted for too long, they just did not have the capacity to storage the, the crop that is about to come. Um, transportation problems, of course, uh, and these uh, included uh, traders, importers and exporters as well, problems at the border, and extensive services because of the restrictions on mobility. Early solutions to these early impacts of uh, the lockdown included green corridors, days and restrictions of movement, health protecting equipment, and of course social protection for the most vulnerable populations. Uh, what we're seeing today, what they're telling us today, is that the end of the lockdown has impacts at the level of the large retailers as wet markets start to open, now they face competition from wet markets and they also see a decrease in the demand uh, from food because of the recession that is already started to impact the economy. Uh, we see households have been uh, hurt uh, from the lack of, of farming employment and uh, we also see difficulties in the financial sector. Banks are reluctant to give credit to farmers. We also learned from our services that uh, some uh, some of the early uh, worries, uh, worries uh, related to uh, traders' movement of merchandise and uh, storage uh, and extension services. This has eased now uh, as countries learn to live with the with the pandemic. The uh, apply solutions at the moment include social protection and subsidies for production. What's going to happen in the post-lockdown impacts uh, from what we've seen uh, is the dynamics repeating of the countries. We're going to see that all farmers will be affected. Is a generalized increase in imports, the experience of liquidity, cash flows at farm level. They have mounting debts and they have limited access to credit. So what do they need? They need uh, financial advice. How to, for example, transform a short debt into a long term. They need access to banks, they need access to markets. And uh, there is a question mark here as to the role of extension nations. As we know them traditionally, technical advice related to production uh, is it uh, the way to go towards value addition when we have a recession looming or is it more efficiency gains increasing the efficiency in which these more expensive inputs need to be used? And of course that post lockdown impacts is going to be on extension services. Extension services will be under pressure both from budget deficits, the public sector, and also in the private sectors, because at the end of the day, these are contractors, like any other operator in uh, supply chains. But they will need, they will need the protective equipment, of course, those who are still employed. Uh, this, 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 is, this is an issue, uh, many are losing employment already. Uh, they need higher demand for their services, agriculture needs to pick up. If agriculture is not there, uh, the, the services will not going to be in demand. They need expertise in financial management because this is what farmers are telling us that they need. And they need the information about market outlets to diversify their outlets. And finally, keep perspective. The last time uh, a pandemic happened was 100 years ago. So um, keep the perspective. There may be, uh, as we learn to work with COVID, uh, financial services needs a new normality, but it's not going to be that different from the one that we've been used to uh, in the past 100 years. Uh, with that, thank you very much. And that's my alarm going off. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Nevena uh, Alexandrova Stefanova, who is Agriculture Extension Officer um, in our unit in FAO in headquarters. But I just also wanted to say that she has been working extensively in the region, uh, both in Eastern um, and Central Europe and in Central Asia. 
And Nevena will tell us about different challenges faced by extension advisory services, as well as different roles and response, uh, responses that they can give during this uh, unprecedented crisis. So Nevena, over to you. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm pleased to talk today about extension and advisory services, their critical role in COVID-19 response and the much needed transformation in extension uh, to improve the resilience and sustainability of our food systems. The impact of COVID-19 in the health economies and food systems is unprecedented and the most vulnerable will be affected the most. Predictions expect increase of poverty and food insecurity, decrease of GDP, labor force at risk. However, the impact across the globe, countries and regions is not even and has many dimensions. Currently, Europe and Central Asia seem to have escaped from the most catastrophic scenarios with their only partial impact on food supply chains, logistics of virtual bulk crops and high value products were affected, food and labor access was affected and not their availability and others. However, medical solution to the health issue is not available yet and it's difficult to predict how the pandemic will be developing in the next three months to a year. To build resilient and sustainable extension services, we need to take both facts and uncertainties into account. But why extension and advisory services can have a major contribution to the COVID response? With its uh, networks of actors already present in the rural communities, with direct and trusted relations with rural producers and other actors of the agriculture value chains, extension and advisory services are very instrumental for national and local governments, as well as for rural communities in bridging information from and to the field. However, not all extension service providers could fulfill those expectations and, and roles. Um, some need to uh, do structural and also other contextual adjustments and adaptation. <coughs> the role <coughs> of advisory services and the demand for their support during the lockdown was even more critical than ever before. Crucial functions include raising awareness on the disease and preventive measures, assessing the field situation, and help inform decisions to be taken by the government, advocacy, support to producers, partnerships, and addressing social issues. <coughs> As many countries are lifting the lockdown, the attention is shifting towards mitigating economic consequences of the pandemic, and again, the role of advisory services is critical in providing support that goes beyond production and includes increasingly value chains. Co coordination, innovation and partnerships are key in achieving success. Critical activities are targeted to ensure access to credits, facilitating access to markets and jobs, for instance, through e-commerce platforms, support export uh, through promotion of food safety standards, support to nutritious food, local value chains, value addition. Social protection and community empowerment is also important, particularly focus with, for women and um, youth to manage better their businesses. COVID-19, with its unprecedented impacts on all sectors of economy, is a game changer in agriculture and will affect extension and advisory services. Like any other disruptor, the COVID uh, will create winners and losers. So we need to learn well and quickly the lessons from the lockdown and the recovery in order to turn the challenges into opportunities. Agricultural foresight in the post-COVID-19 um, uh, reality uh, suggests an increased pace of digitalization in agriculture, increased um, integration of technologies, um, shifting um, steadily a focus from um, rural areas to peri-urban areas, um, inclusiveness and sustainability and resilience will always uh, stay in the focus on agricultural transformation and agricultural development. In terms of innovations, local multi-actor and disruptive innovations will be playing an increasing role. Um, therefore, uh, installing of uh, mechanisms to mitigate risk and social protection uh, will be much needed. How extension and advisory services will be transforming to cope with the post-COVID-19 reality. 
First of all, they need to capitalize on the pluralism to go digital, including also disruptive digital innovations, uh, in addition to the incremental ones. Adapt to emerging clients and emerging topics. Acquire new capacities, some structural transformation, for instance, towards service integration um, uh, at local level, like health, vet, social, and advisory services, uh, sharing space, resources, and data for the benefit of local uh, population. And finally, I would like to uh, give some uh, take-home messages. Advisory um, systems need to transform themselves to be able to ensure continuous support to food systems and to embrace disruptions like COVID-19. Advisory systems need to innovate from within, which can be achieved with uh, comprehensive actions in the strength and capacities, targeted investments, participatory policies, and adequate infrastructure. It is critical that extension and advisory services would be able to rapidly capitalize on the COVID experience, would observe trends, anticipate challenges, and plan and innovate where most needed and in innovate interactively to be able to scale up and increase the innovation pace. For more information, please follow us on our website and resources. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, thank you, Nevena. I would like now to invite uh, Inge van Ost, who is a policy officer from European Commission, DG Agri, to talk about integration of the advisory services in future common agricultural policy and agricultural knowledge and innovation system strategic plans. Unfortunately, Inge could not attend this webinar in person, but uh, she sent a pre-recording of her uh, presentation and Ms. Aniko Juhas, the co-chair of the Standing Committee on Agriculture Research, which is a working group on ACIS, kindly agreed to participate and take the questions directed to Inge on behalf of the ACIS group. So over to you, Inge. Morning, dear people. Um, I'm Inge van Oost. I work at the European Commission for uh, DG Agri in the unit research and innovation. I will tell you something about what we are planning after 2020 in the new seven years period, where we will completely change our advisory system into an integration of our advisory services within the agricultural knowledge and innovation system. And this is a very broad system. It is the organization and interaction of all persons, organization and institutions who use and produce knowledge and innovation for agriculture and interrelated fields. So those are farmers, foresters, advisors, researchers, farmers, organizations, NGOs, networks, retailers, etc. And they all produce and need knowledge. So we want really to create a regional and national innovation ecosystem by having better knowledge flows between all those people in the ACIS. And you can read a little bit more through the link that you find in this slide below. So this is, in a nutshell, how we see our ACAS, the farmer is in the middle, we have to support him. It's a common agricultural policy of Europe and we want to support him to modernization, to have more innovation and more knowledge flows, better knowledge flows. And all these actors in the ACAS will be supportive for that. And today we zoom in on what advisors can do. First of all, you must know that uh, we have 27 now member states, and they are all very different. The ACIS systems go from very fragmented at the left side, uh, you see a number of countries there, where you see that the institutions and organizations are all working on their own. And of course, the ideal situation is to be more integrated 
And there, at the right-hand side, you see already a number of countries who are quite well doing that, having structural platforms, interchanges between their knowledge and users and producers. And then another thing which plays a big role is, of course, the investments done in the Aegis. And on the top, you see the member states who have little investments, little money and budget going into their Aegis system. And uh, at the bottom end, you see strong countries who have a lot of money and a lot of investments into their Aegis system. But as you notice, they are not always well connected. Even the most famous uh, knowledge uh, countries have not always well integrated systems. So this is where we are aiming for. Now, we are not starting from scratch. Since 2012, we launched EIP Agri, and there we developed together with the ACIS group this interactive innovation model. And we apply it in any innovative project that we fund, whether it is under the CAP or under the research framework Horizon 2020. Under the CAP, we call them operational groups. Under Horizon, we call them multi-act projects. But they follow the same principle. And these four lines explain it very short. So we want that in our innovation projects, there is collaboration between various actors, no researchers only projects, to make the best use of complementary types of knowledge. So the practitioners will bring in practice knowledge, the scientists will in bring in scientific knowledge, but also a number of other actors will bring in maybe organizational knowledge and, and so much more. So we want them, we ask them, we force them, in fact, it's an obligation to co-create, so to work together, not with one dominating person, but really all along the project, each actor uh, has to work together and co-create so that also the end users get co-ownership and feel this is a solution we built and that they are ready to implement it. So the opportunities of the solutions coming out should be mature for practice and also have the end users willing and uh, ready to implement it into practice. We also have a network who is helping that and who is connecting between the two big funding sources, between the CAP funding and between the Horizon funding. And one thing we're working now on in the next period much more is something we had already before and which supported our operational groups sometimes, but only in 12% of the cases our innovation support services. You see there at the left side, we can fund them with cap money under the advisory measure, but it is not well taken up. And we see that for our operational groups, it's quite essential because farmers have an idea, they come with a bottom-up idea and they need people who help them to connect them to the right scientists, to the right retailers, to the right businesses, etc. And so we think that advisors are the perfect persons. We have a number of very good examples already now that can help the others to start up. And it has become now an obligation to have innovation support in each country. So this is new. From the ACIS, we have picked out the advisors, researchers and CAT networks in particular who need to work better together. Because advisors are close to farmers, they, can, they are multipliers, they bring the things to the farmers and they also capture the needs of the farmers. Researchers have a lot of things where they can help us with. And our CAP networks will share all the knowledge from all these uh, projects and make events with it to disseminate it. So this working together of these three essential uh, elements of the ACIS is very important and of course in their cap plans we also expect our countries to explain them more precisely which interventions they chose to support advice and innovation support services because it will be more than one it will be training of advisors it will be uh, setting of new advisory services it will be uh, developing this innovation support etc now the articles on advice, um, they oblige, of course, advice, as we had 
in the in the past also, but now there's an obligation that uh, any advisor, not only a few certified advisors, and as in the former system, but all advisors, existing advisors, trusted advisors by the farmers, should be integrated within the ACES in a, in an inclusive way um, and they have to be able to cover not only as in the past cross compliance and a, a number of de dedicated fields we want to, to cover them anything let's say that is sustainability being the economic part and the environmental part of course the climate part also and social dimensions so they have to be able to cover everything, not each advisor will cover everything, but in total in the country, uh, the member state needs to organize it in a way that all this is covered and that our advisors deliver up-to-date technological and scientific information developed by research and innovation. And there are the CAP networks to help them. We expect, and that was all worked out through the, the SCAR uh, ACUS group, uh, the type of back offices that advisors will probably set up to support their advisors on the field with good knowledge, recent knowledge, innovative knowledge. A new thing also in this period is that we absolutely want our advisors to be impartial. We don't want companies, and this is often the case of course, because the public advisory system has more or less collapsed. There's still a little bit left, but not so much. Uh, overall in the EU, we have still good examples, but there are few. So we ask that any intervention that we fund for advisors, that it goes to impartial advisors. And we ask them, I already said that, that they are able and that they uh, train themselves to be able to be this intermediate person and be well connected to provide innovation support to prepare and implement operational group projects. And then one of my last slides puts it all uh, a little bit uh, in a picture. So what kind of roles of farm advisors do we have? First of all, they are excellent persons to capture the practice needs. So any idea from a farmer, but also from other people, they are there to capture them. Then together, providing innovation support, they can broker, they can bring certain people together that are the best to have complementary knowledge to work on these operational group proposals. Once this project is finished, we have good proposals that are much better built than the usual ones. That's our experience already now. Um, and from these already good proposals, we select then the very best. Once the projects are running, again, the farmers can become facilitators because they are good intermediates between farmers, they speak their language, and between researchers. So we see another role there for them. And then uh, once the project is finished, they are ideal disseminators for the project results and to work together with our CAP networks, maybe in events where they can attract their farmers and other farmers and really um, express the results in a way that farmers would understand them easily. So this is it, um, by uh, focusing in each country to build better ACESs and then with our networks to better interconnect them, we will build a very big EU ACES with nice creativity in each country through this innovation support better practice application because we involve the end users, the farmers in it. We will have a better connectivity through our networks and in that way, quicker circulation of up-to-date information to the advisors that can bring it then to their clients. Thank you so much. And I think that this uh, free presentation really set the scenes for the rest of the webinar. Before we hear from countries about their concrete uh, experiences, I would like to invite all the participants to reflect about uh, two questions, which I hope that you can see now on my screen. I will also 
paste these questions into the chat box so you can reflect also during while well, listening to the following presentation. So please uh, share your experience and ideas about it. How we know that COVID-19 posed an unprecedented challenge to the agriculture and food sector and extension and advisory services, forcing us all to rethink uh, EIS functions, the way they operate, partnerships they make, governance, and also their capacities to adapt rapidly. So based on your experience, what do you think should EIS stop doing? What also do you think EIS should start doing and even do more? So please uh, go ahead and um, share your thoughts about it. As I said, I'm also uh, pasting these questions into the chat so you can see them later. And I would also now like uh, to pass to the next block of the presentations, uh, which will be on concrete country cases. We will hear about real life challenges uh, from different countries and also how in different countries they try to, uh, extension advisory services try to overcome these challenges. What is also interesting, I believe, is that uh, we'll have a perspective of different stakeholders because these presentations will be shared by UN agencies, by government, by cooperative, and uh, by a cooperative, and also by an association of extension providers. So I think it will bring this diversified perspective. And on this note, I would like to uh, invite Ms. Melek Chekmak, uh, who is the head of the FAO Liaison Office in Azerbaijan and also FAO representative in this country, to talk about experience in Azerbaijan. Over to you, Melek. Dear participants, I'm very happy to be here with you today to talk about how we're via two EU funded projects in Azerbaijan strengthening the pluralistic agricultural advisory system to respond to COVID-19 challenges. My presentation will be composed of four parts, namely ensuring coordination of the AIS service providers and beyond, ensuring timely information to and from the field on COVID-19 impacts, synergies with other projects, next steps after the lockdown. Um, the AAS in Azerbaijan is rather fragmented with a wide variety of actors with no organized and systematic knowledge exchange collaboration and synergies between the different providers and actors. The ongoing AAS project aims at improving the system on solid assessment, identifying good EU practices, developing recommendations on rational working models at multiple levels. On the other hand, the other EU-funded project on local food promotion aims at improving value chains via strengthening the agricultural extension services. As you know, COVID-19 posed challenges in service del delivery and increase the need for supporting farmers. The project working group as an overall coordination mechanism took the opportunity to link all actors to discuss sustainability issues, challenges and priorities of AAS during the pandemic times by exchanging ideas particularly on solutions via electronic platforms, networking, market information dissemination. How do we disseminate information to the field? The two projects helped us to prepare information notes, which we distributed. In addition, regional workshops on agricultural mapping are planned in June. Furthermore, advisory messages to farmers are delivered through national and local media. How do we gather information from the field on COVID-19 impact is through the cooperation with the Agriculture Service of the Minister of Agriculture, 
In addition, we will be networking with 750 farmers. We have synergies with the Rural Youth Employment Project, Rural Women Project, and the project between Agrar University and Wahiningan Agricultural University, and the Local Food Promotion Project in areas of survey, joint survey or survey methodology rather, and um, development of rural business information database and ICTs to be used by farmers. The next steps of the current project will be networking expansion for informing, selling, buying, harvesting and processing. Furthermore, supporting farmers to farmers business and social communication by using media channels and local AIS providers uh, will be an important area of work. We will be facilitating joint storages and facilities through platforms. We will continue advocating support to local market, markets and we'll be promoting PPP for the relocation of markets to larger premises while ensuring quality and food safety. To conclude my presentation, I would like to say that AAS in Azerbaijan are well positioned to provide timely and relevant information of COVID, on COVID-19 impacts and measures. Knowing the most impactful communication channels used by farmers and having an access to farmers' database is a great advantage during the crisis time. The digital tools such as blockchains with the active participation of AAS can play important role for rap rapid recovery of the impacts. Finally, AAS shall capitalize on COVID-19 experiences and position themselves better in support of rural employment, value chains and digitalization. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Malik. I would like now to take you all to Europe, uh, to North Macedonia, concretely. And uh, I'm inviting Alexander Musalewski, who is the head of the uh, unit policy analysis at the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Water Economy in North Macedonia. Um, he will speak about an online platform which matches the offer and demand of agriculture products in North Macedonia. Over to you. Hello to everyone. Uh, thanks for a lot to FAO to give us a chance to participate to this webinar and to give us also a chance to show what we done in order to help to farmers in COVID-19 time. Uh, so from the beginning of February, this problem started uh, with the market and our farmers uh, had problem to sell their uh, products to, to the consumers. So in order to help to the farmers, we built an online platform offering the man. Uh, the goals of the, the or yeah, to build the farm, the, the online platform is uh, the, the farmer to sell agriculture products in the period of COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, farmers to fix their ass to market, uh, consumers uh, purchase of agriculture products from small producers, which is very important because we have a lot of small uh, farms in our country. Uh, to, the, the farmers to have direct contact uh, to the, with the consumers. And also, which is very important for our uh, country, I think the possibility for building online, uh, uh, to building of supply chains uh, between agro-industry and, and the farmers. Uh, participants in this uh, online platform are the farmers, local and national consumers, uh, cooperatives, association of farmers, agro-industry, uh, the regional branches of Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Water Economy, National Exchange Agency, uh, which have uh, together with the branch, branches of ministry role to, to enter the data on, on the platform. Uh, and the admin on this platform is the unit for 
cash market reform system, which is in the scope of the Department for Agriculture Policy Analysis. Uh, how to sell the agriculture products? Uh, there are two ways. Uh, one way is to 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 send email to to direct the, the admin and the admin to post the the product which farmer wants to sell to, to the online platform. And the second way is to to, to go to the regional branches of the, the farmer to go to the regional branches to the ministry or a national extension agency and to give uh, information. So the, the, the farmer should fulfill uh, one small questionnaire. But here we have name and surname of farmer, the city, phone number of farmer, email if if they have email, if not just the phone number, what kind of agriculture product they are selling, uh, quantity of the, the products, and, and also they should uh, one small the tour three sets of uh, description of the agriculture products. And uh, when the, the, the farmer will fulfill this questionnaire, then the, the employees from the ministry and the advisory body are entering the data on the platform. Uh, here you can find the online platform, so if you want, you can uh, check it, how it's functioning, but also you can find it in English. And uh, unfortunately, until now, we don't have very big interest that the farmers to, to, to to sell the, the products uh, directly on the online platform. So that reason I will uh, finish my presentation with the questions. So is it easy to the farmer first to to give the, the, the to, to find the system and to, to give the information about the, the products? Also, how to increase the interest to sell agriculture products online? How to improve the system when the uh, when when you will see the system? Maybe you will give us some advices how the system to be improved. Uh, how to introduce advisors in the system? This is all very interesting uh, in, because the, maybe when the advisors are going to the farm to give advice of for the production, maybe it's good to give the advice how to sell the the, the products, not just how to produce. Um, and also for a large country now, because we have still COVID-19, how in the COVID-19 period, uh, on how the COVID-19 is reflected on the advisory system, having in mind that now the, the people are scared to have contact between themselves. And also uh, last week we had the uh, police hours in our country. So thanks a lot for your attention uh, and I hope that I will find your answers. Thanks a lot again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now let's move a little bit further to the east and let's hear from uh, Tachnina uh, Sulfayaeva, uh, the Deputy Director of Service Cooperative Sarov in Tajikistan, about the remote EIS service provision. Over to you. Dear participants, I am showing our experience in cooperative startup, uh, how we are providing consultation during uh, coronavirus pandemic in Tajikistan. Non-commercial cooperative startup is an organization of economists for providing agriculture consultation to the farmers. Our aim is to ensure access uh, of farmers to agriculture knowledge, information and markets through providing theoretical and practical trainings, implementing new technology through demonstration fields and the testing of uh, agriculture machinery and uh, agriculture technology, improving uh, farmers' experience on decision-making and uh, improving linkages between suppliers, uh, buyers and processors. It's very important for uh, extension organization to stay in connection these uh, members and their clients during um, uh, COVID-19 crisis. In Tajikistan, COVID-19 was announced at the end of April, and uh, April is a very important time for farmers as they are busy with planting, and they all are in the field, and they are very vulnerable in such situation. Majority of cooperative members, also as agronomists, and they are providing um, 
uh, advisory service to the neighboring farmers. This is uh, uh, is advantage for cooperative and uh, allows us to be in connection with farmers during uh, COVID-19 lockdown and continue providing information and consultation to our members. It's very important to provide valuable information on time and through um, uh, another approach which we had to accommodate to the current lockdown situation by sharing advisories among our members, agronomists via various online channels, mostly wider. In some cases where our agronomists are not using uh, internet, we are providing our advisories through conference calls. The pandemic has completed us to explore these channels even more to remain connected with the cooperative members and farmers. And we understand that the extension service is increasingly depending on, on uh, online resources and we should in the future to learn more about available resources and to adapt it to our um, services. Uh, we can provide our consultation in the distance to our um, members, but as they are farmers and they are in the field, they are providing consultation to the uh, farmers at the field level. And for that, we developed an approach for protecting our members, consultants and farmers. For that, they should to follow instruction uh, like uh, Provide, uh, they should provide just individual consultation, not group training or seminars. They all should use protective uh, equipment. And farmers, advisors, farm workers should follow social distance during consultation and field work. Also, we could support our agronomists with protective equipment like masks, gloves, and antiseptics. Uh, the support of our uh, partners' organizations. This is some pictures uh, from our agronomists work in the field when they are providing consultation to the farmers and to the workers based on the field situation. Thanks, it's information about our activities. Thank you. Now let's uh, move back to Europe uh, and Yuri Bakun from National Association of Advisory Services in Ukraine will tell us how they were uh, turning the, this challenge into an opportunity. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar and I'm happy to share with you information regarding the impact of coronavirus on farmers' economic activities and how advisory service help in this situation. Ukraine is not unique in relation to the COVID-19. As for the impact on producers, it is such factors as not predictable situation, problem with sales, lack of sources of ways to attract finance for agricultural producers. In these circumstances, assistance from advisory services was also aimed to resolve in such topical issues. In the work of advisory service during the crisis became more relevant such methods as distance learning and consulting, creating of a digital trading platforms using social networks, assistance in finding sales channels, finding finance and introducing new management methods that include antiviral uh, measures in the workplace. I would especially like to pay attention to such issues that escalated during the pandemic. This is a need to establish mutual understanding producers and processors and sales networks as purchasing power has decreased and payment delays have arisen. Therefore, it was necessary to look for compromises and accordingly, the advisory services had to work with each of the players in order to put them at the negotiation table and find the best solution for everywhere. 
as noted earlier from the beginning of the epidemic, banks began to more often refuse credit and many farmers felt a worsening financing situation. It was necessary to look for new possible resources and uh, advised to pay attention to working with credit unions, such uh, tools as crop receipt. After um, another example is a serious problem of having a large number of unregistered farmers in Ukraine. Essentially, they suffered the most because they have neither access to state support system, finance, or to insurance of possible risks. In order to get them out of the shell, they need the support of advisors who can help deal with bureaucratic threats and show advantages to work in a clear way. In reality, during the crisis, the number of calls to advisors for such assistance has increased significantly. And despite all the situation and challenges associated with COVID-19, it induced advisors looking new uh, opportunities for increasing the demand for advisory services, especially in the field attraction, uh, finance, legalizing the farming businesses and provide market-oriented support of farmers. For example, market information, possibility to partnership, etc. COVID-19 situation forced the extension of advisory service providers in Ukraine to innovate rapidly, including by interaction and cooperation with a wider variety of shareholders. Ukraine need new solution to create sustainable and effective advisory system. I hope this experience will inform the process of identify effective models for extension and advisory service delivery in Ukraine, driven by FAO project in cooperation with FAO regional office and research and extension unit FAO in Rome. Thank you very much. If you have a question, I'm ready to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Yuri, but also to all the uh, presenters. And uh, we can see that we, have, we are having quite a lively discussion in the chat and in, in the Q&A. So I would like now open the floor for the questions and answers and introduce uh, Delger Matrun Batar, Dagi, our Agriculture Extension Officer in our unit and um, Huyun Yang, Agriculture and Training, uh, Agriculture Training and Extension Officer also in our unit, uh, who will facilitate the discussion, both Q&A to the presenters and our reflection in the chat. And I would just like also uh, to remind that uh, our colleague Jana, who is a program coordination uh, asso uh, associate in regional office, is translating questions for us from Russian into to English. And Andrew uh, Fieldstand, international expert on rural development and extension services, uh, is facilitating and picking up the questions from the YouTube uh, live stream. Over to you. Thank you, Sofia. Good day to everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, so there are plenty full of questions in the, in the Q&A box and I have tried to pick seven for each speakers. So it would be great if uh, the, our panelists keep your answer concise within one minute. And uh, then also I'd like to encourage all the speakers to also respond the remaining questions in Q&A box, okay? So let me start from Petro. Petro, there is a question from a permanent mission from Azerbaijan to Rome-based agencies asking if we know some of the countries in Europe had difficulties in providing labor force to agriculture and how was it overcome? In which sector was most suffered from COVID-19 related measures? And maybe I will read out the, all the questions so that uh, subsequent speakers can also prepare their answers. Um, Nivena, there is a question that you also responded, but I think it's relevant to others to hear, is what mitigation measures are available to smallholders if they don't have access to digital innovative mechanisms. 
And you also said that the importance of innovation and in, uh, within extension advisory services and uh, also the improvement of capacities. And uh, so can you give us an example how this has been done hand in hand? Okay, so there is a question to Inge, Aniko, if you would like to take this question for her. So while we agree that integration is important and transformation and extension is needed, can you tell us more how can extension and advisory services prepare better for future lockdowns? And are we able to invest more in digital technologies and e-learning for farmers and agricultural cooperatives? Okay, then Melik uh, and Yuri, if you guys want to pick on this question from Central Asia. Uh, so the, the participant says that smallholders are often neglected and most affected from the disruption of extension advisory services during pandemic. How the measures and response actions are different from other situations like natural disasters. Can you give us an example? How is it done in Azerbaijan or other Central Asian countries? Okay, Alexander, uh, there are a lot of questions on Macedonia. I think your platform was a hit. <laughs> but uh, uh, so there are, while well, you can go back to Q&A question and answer many of those, I have a couple for you. Um, I picked two for you because they're, I felt they're very important. Can you tell us how do you make sure the quality, relevance and re reliability of those information shared through this platform? Okay, I think it's very important in general as we move to digital innovation services. Then there is another question. Why do you think there were low interest from farmers to use that platform? So then finally, uh, Tachmina, um, who pays for the services as well as masks and gloves in their presentation you presented? If it is farmers, are there many far farmers willing to pay for that? So this is it. Let's start from Petro and then uh, Ivana. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your question. Uh, labor, yes. Well, restrictions in mobility clearly affected labor in agriculture. And not just at farm level, but also in slaughterhouses. Um, this was a, a generalized phenomenon. Um, the uh, countries in the region uh, imposed some, uh, some regulations related to the re uh, movement of people that had to do with uh, the need to get permits to uh, transport workers to rural areas and the uh, working hours also were, were much shorter. And that means there's going to be a, a decrease in, in, in productivity. This is the, the, the immediate impact. Of course, in Europe, there is also uh, the issue of labor force and migration that has also had an impact on, on, on agriculture in, in, in Europe and in the European Union in particular. Uh, we, could, uh, we could expand on this, uh, but uh, they just giving me one minute to just to introduce the, the most relevant aspects of, 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 uh, of labor. One thing that is clear now is that the situation in terms of labor ability, availability is improving as we learn to live with COVID. This is something that needs to be also highlighted. So when, I, when I mentioned in my presentation that some of these uh, problems are slowly beginning to, to, resolve, to be resolved, this is one of them, transportation and labor mobility. Thank you. Evena? Yes, um, on the question of uh, mitigation measures and uh, relation to smallholders, um, actually I was describing the post-COVID-19 reality in which we could assume that digitalization will um, be advanced. However, uh, as the lockdown uh, and even during the recovery phase of the COVID-19, it was important to ensure um, continuous support to farmers and also uh, being in, simply in human contact, if you wish, uh, with the farmers and producers, 
uh, those that are also most vulnerable, um, then reality showed that uh, many um, extension and advisory service providers were using very simple tools to stay in contact with their clients. For instance, messenger chats or um, uh, rural radios. For instance, in Azerbaijan, um, the University of Agriculture have their own uh, radio channel and uh, TV. So this was actually put into operation. So of course, with um, digitalization in the uh, in near future, um, which is expected after the um, um, COVID crisis, um, the, uh, uh, we, the impact and possibility for exclusion of smallholders and other vulnerable people has to be assessed. And for this, extension services shall play uh, a particular role uh, here because they are uh, still considered as uh, neutral brokerage, um, neutral um, uh, brokers of knowledge. Over to you. Okay. Um... Uh, Anika, do you want to take the question for Inge? Yes, fine. So I, I looked for the question you read, uh, you read, but I couldn't find it either in the Q and A or in the chat. So uh, if you can help me um, again, which one was it? I will read it to you, Anika. Okay, okay, you okay. okay. Um, so the question was how can extension and advisory services prepare better for future lockdowns? Okay. Are we able to invest more in digital technologies and e-learning for farmers as well as farmer cooperatives? Mm -hmm. okay. Claire? Yes, clear. So um, actually what we think is that uh, every bad thing uh, has something um, good in it. And uh, I think uh, the lockdown showed uh, in our countries uh, that the extension services and the advisory services um, can be operated uh, through digital uh, tools. And actually all of these tools are there either on the market or already used, but they were not used so extensively because uh, uh, farmers are usually um, more persuaded to change their behavior uh, if they see uh, tangible um, results, so see the other farmers uh, and uh, not through digital uh, tools. So for the farmers, it's even more uh, difficult to get used to these uh, tools. But what we could see uh, that uh, the COVID crisis uh, gave a big push in changing um, these behaviors and starting to use digital tools as much um, as we can. Um, so I think that's something positive coming out. Um, yes, also the second question, we should invest in technologies. And I think the new um, possibilities and the new funds coming from, uh, from the European Union, uh, Next Generation and EU React um, fund is, is, um, is an opportunity, at least uh, for the European Union countries. Um, we are uh, now trying to put together uh, programs, investment programs uh, for digitalization and uh, make it part of, of either the cohesion funds or, or CAP. Uh, so I think in a few weeks time, we will have um, concrete, concrete examples and experiences uh, how to um, how to to develop um, investment programs for digitalization for farmers as well for farmers and also as well for for advisors and extension services and um, the third thing what we saw we, it, it's less um, connected to advisors and and uh, extension services but more connected to AKIS and knowledge transfer is that um, during the coronavirus, a um, lot of the small farmers, usual um, supply chain outlets, farmers markets um, were prohibited to, uh, to, to work as normal. 
So, so all these small farmers um, uh, selling to farmers market or horeca sector, they had uh, problems, um, market marketplace problems, and uh, but the adaptation of of uh, these farmers were very quick, and a lot of um, quite easy but good solution came up how to uh, to make farmers market work in this situation and uh, a lot of good solutions for uh, online marketing tools developed for for smaller farmers uh, came up as well um, quite naturally so it was not organized by someone it was a sort of survival tactic of the small uh, farmers but this is an experience which we now start to collect um, and have um, uh, start to have a sort of um, um, collection or catalog of, of good practices. And if we will have time in the next months or next year to analyze it and make it into a program, I think that would be something uh, which can help us to be prepared for, for the next such um, crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Anike. And uh, so Milik and Yuri, would you like to answer the question about Central Asia? Let us try to keep our answer short as possible on size. Um, yes. Uh, the question to me was how different AIS during the times of pandemic than uh, natural disasters, right? Yes, go ahead. Yes, okay. Um, <clears throat> um, well, I can say that luckily I didn't have um, experience uh, to uh, deliver services, uh, FAO services, technical service during the times of natural disasters. But I can speculate how different it can, it can be. Um, while the natural uh, disasters can be geographically confined and um, as per its impact on the agriculture uh, can be also limited to maybe certain uh, crops and uh, areas, uh, this one is affecting uh, the whole country and uh, the whole geography and um, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's a part of a global problem. Uh, it induces um, uh, economic slowdown, and particularly for Azerbaijan, it's been a double uh, issue as the fallen um, because of the fallen um, oil prices, which is the you know oil sector is the backbone of the economy. And uh, as it is uh, a nationwide issue problem, uh, it can be socially and politically stress stressful. Um, luckily in Azerbaijan, the uh, Minister of Agriculture is <clears throat> very much focusing on digitalization and innovations as uh, main pillars in, in the development, sustainable development of agriculture. Um, uh, and therefore, uh, they pay uh, attention to uh, invest in the uh, technologies and, and the system like uh, advancing e-agriculture system in the country. Um, we will be able to um, uh, complement and uh, really uh, uh, hopefully uh, make uh, create uh, more uh, impact in our uh, digital platforms to reach out to farmers in the coming uh, coming days. And I think the, the current uh, <clears throat> efforts under our project also uh, through networking uh, really help us to uh, better understand the effects, the negative effects uh, of the pandemic on the farmers and also uh, identify, uh, better identify their needs, prioritized needs. So uh, I, I think um, 
there are a lot of similarity similarities, of course, uh, between uh, all um, the impact of all crises on agriculture. But um, uh, I, I think this uh, this is a, a more comprehensive, yeah. more wide range, and 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 socially also very dis distressful. And this is the case um, here too. And we're hoping that with the um, current measures of the government uh, to support the small farms with uh, credit to help resolve their liquidity problem with a uh, 50 15 million US dollar program now uh, will um, uh, ease the tension. But again, uh, we understand now that uh, um, the, the, it is very important that the uh, governments have at the local level very good rural finance uh, service systems. So this will be another complementary uh, project, hopefully, in the coming uh, months for, for us in Azerbaijan. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Milik. Sorry. Um... We have to be a little bit conscious of time. Yuri, do you like to emphasize on the inclusion of the smallholders on this? How can we make sure that the smallholders are not neglected? Yuri, you are muted. We cannot hear you. Um, uh, do you hear me? Ah, okay. Um, uh, small farmers in Ukraine uh, were a main target group for advisory services always, but uh, recently, uh, recently the uh, state government uh, has begun to pay attention to this group, and uh, this year, a new initiative has been developed in order to advise them. And I assure that this uh, consolidation effort uh, uh, bring uh, results because um, advisory services must be uh, um, lead in this process uh, always. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Um, thanks. So. Uh... Alexander, would you like to take the floor? Macedonia, are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, go on with your questions. Uh, start, okay. I already I'm answering the question on the question and answers immediately. So I, I I don't have question. If I have it, I will put it directly on the Q and A uh, part. Okay. Okay, but could you like to quickly address the how do you ensure the quality of uh, information in your platform, and uh, why farmers are not interested in using platform? Just quickly. Uh -huh, okay, because I answer it uh, by typing. But okay, I will again. So the regarding information, uh, we have the questionnaire which the farmers is answering. When they are going in the regional branch of the ministry of NEA or, or the advisory center, so let's say we have uh, the fulfilled question from the farmers about the, the quality of the products, and also here is very important to have the trust between the, the farmers and the final the, the consumers, and uh, I think that we will not have problems that, 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 that and our farmers are very honest and. I think that we will not have problem with this uh, this kind of type of problems. Uh, so sure quality but, because it's an important question. Sorry. Quality of information on your platform. How do you ensure make sure that there are good quality? They're relevant. Yeah, the quality. The quality. The farmers is describing the quality of the product. So what type of the crop, let's say, and the quality of the product. So when the consumer will uh, look for the for the for the product, uh, he will uh, see immediately in the in the box uh, what kind of products is selling the farmer and with the quality. And then today, uh, and, uh, and at the end, also they can com communicate between themselves. So the consumer is uh, phoning the farmer to 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 also they should uh, you know to, to to let's say to make the price of the product. 
not okay. just the, the quality, you know. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, okay. So, Admina, quickly to, to your question. Uh, there was uh, some questions regarding um, support with, uh, is it, can you hear me? Uh, with support of mask and gloves, we can answer it in chat box that uh, uh, it was support from uh, our partner organization donors and we give this Takmina, the question is the payment system. Who pays for the services? Do farmers pay or somebody else pays for the service and masks and gloves? If so, are there any farmers? farmers. The, uh, for the consultation, farmers pay. And uh, uh, some of them are paying in kind, means from from the produced product and some of them paying in cash. But for the growth, it was support from the uh, some of donor organizations who are working in RAS system. And uh, there were some other questions about the restriction of the traveling in Tajikistan. Actually, there was restriction in some parts of Tajikistan, especially in North part, but we still stay in collection because our agronomists, they also are farmers and they're working in the field. And uh, we were in connection with them with online resources like Viber or a conference call. And they were in connection with farmers directly in the field. Thank and you. there was another question about the number of the service provided. As yeah. I mentioned, we have 250 active agronomists. Some of them are located in the remote area like uh, Zarafshan Valley and um, an average if of each of them are covering 20 farms, which including Thank you. minimum 30 members. I think we have to, you know, um, keep working on the q and box. And I'd like to have all the speakers pay attention to the q and box. And there are 11 questions not yet answered. Please go there and answer them directly. But before closing the discussion, I'd like to give floor to my colleague, Yang, to give quick uh, reflection from the chat room. Yang, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, TK. And uh, Sophie. I, I just wanted to know, we have, a, we have a second round of presentations, right? Yes, OK. So uh, dear colleagues and dear participants, and I would like to thank you all for your activity, active participation of this webinar. And all of us have noticed that COVID-19 has created so much impacts and challenges on food security and agriculture system. The main nature of those challenges are globally, fundamentally, and long-term. One important aspect of this webinar is to facilitate the interactions among our participants. Currently, some countries in Europe and Central Asia are still fighting against COVID-19, and many countries are in the process of the opening up. Actually, all of us are very happy for that we can gradually back to normal. But actually, this is not back to a normal, just like the past life before. Everything has changed by the pandemic, so it is a new normal. All of us notice that our EAS workers must make a fund fundamental changes and innovations to adapt to this new normal. So at this crucial transition stage, we must figure out what kind of changes and innovations should be made which directions and ways should those changes and innovations go? And in order to answer those two, questions, two key questions, our unit has developed two very simple and basic questions, which are presented by my colleague Sophia. The first one is what should our EAS stop doing? And what should continue to or start to do? And I hope all of you 
would like to make contributions re regarding to your answers, inputs, comments, good practice, and the experience in the chat room. I'm monitoring the chat room and I will try my best to summarize your key points and the feedback to your other second round of presentations. Thank you very much. Over. Sophia, Sophia back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yang, and also Dagi, and to all the participants and panelists for this discussion. I realize that we are a little bit uh, over time, but we have still a couple of very interesting um, presentations because we know that we it's not only about countries, but we have also regional and sub-regional actors who are working very hard to uh, facilitate the transformation of extension advisory services. So we would like now to hear about uh, experience of regional networks and working groups uh, in this regard. Uh, and I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Pascal Bergeret uh, from uh, Agriculture Knowledge and Innovation System and uh, Standing Committee on Agriculture Research. He's a co chair and he's also from Institut Agronomique Méditerranéen de Montpellier. Uh, he will present about uh, experience of this um, working group. Unfortunately, he could not be present in person. So Ms. Aniko Yuhas, uh, whom I introduced uh, before, she kindly agreed uh, and make herself available to answer also uh, to his questions on behalf of the ACUS group. So over to you. Hi, everyone. The Strategic Working Group on ACIS, Agricultural Knowledge and Innovation Systems, was created under SCAR 10 years ago. SCAR is the Standing Committee on Agricultural Research. SCAR comprises representatives of EU member states and associated countries to advise the Commission and member states on the coordination of agricultural research. Since 2010, the ACIS Group has met regularly as a think tank. It comprises 70 experts from 30 countries. Its members come from various horizons, government, research, education, extension and advisory services, sometimes farmers. It meets three to four times a year in different countries with no dedicated running budget. The group produces policy briefs it commissions studies and holds discussions with research and innovation project holders. Its members participate in EU conferences. In the last 10 years, the enthusiasm, the dedication of the group members and the free discussions among them translated into signals sent to policymakers in the Commission and the member states. The group contributed to clarify and build consensus on the ACIS concept and its main components, such as the multi-actor approach to innovation, now embedded in the EU research and innovation policy through the multi-actor research projects and the thematic networks. The multi-actor approach is similarly embedded into the second pillar of the CAP through the operational groups of the European Innovation Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture. In a nutshell, one can say that the group contributed to the elaboration of an ACIS policy in the EU and in its member states, culminating with the present preparation of the new common agricultural policy which contains provision for member states to define an explicit ACIS strategy. The present mandate of the group deals with issues pertaining to further enlarging and consolidating the ACIS policies through the EU. In our times of big challenges, agriculture has to become more and more knowledge intensive the participation of all actors in the generation, the sharing and the application of knowledge is crucial. 
We need vibrant ACIS's and strong ACIS policies to support them. Thank you for attention. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, let's hear from Southeastern European Advisory Services Network, SEASN. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, Milan Husniak, the head of uh, SEAS main office, and Ms. Uh, Josipa Arapovic, who is a SEAS volunteer. Thank you. Over to you. Hello, everybody from Croatia. Welcome to the season presentation to our webinar, uh, COVID-19. Uh, regional solution to global crisis, Southeastern European Advisory Service Network experience. About season, season is the association of agricultural advisory services and similar organization in uh, the region. Currently, season has 15 members from, diff from 11 different countries in Southeast Europe. Our main goal is increasing the efficiency of agricultural advisory services in the region. Main current activities are implementation of the EU projects. Currently, we have Horizon 2020 project Fair Share, I2 Connect, and Erasmus Plus project Wise Farmer, all on the topic of the digitalization in agriculture. Second main activities is international cooperation with similar organization like uh, International Academic of uh, Agriculture Advisor German-speaking uh, countries, uh, European Forum for Rural Advisory Services, and uh, GIFAS. Season COVID-19 crisis short-term response is following. Season over online member communication during March and April of 2020 has increased by 50% compared to the same period last year. This intense communication is most linked to the information sharing regarding the response to the current crisis situation. That shows that season has been functioning as an original info desk and in style of season common back office. Our short-term response had also been to apply for the Smart AgriHub COVID-19 call, digital interrogation network for agriculture household and small funds at regional level to cope with disruptive events. To talk briefly about long-term regional response on COVID-19 crisis. The types and successes of farmers' reaction to global crises largely depend on regional, natural, economic and social context. Copy-paste global solutions often work only sporadically. Season will, through intensive exchange of knowledge and experience, generate efficiency within the work of advisory services and provide very effective support to farmers in creating a successful and sustainable solutions to reduce the harmful effects of global crises. The problem is that the Southeastern European countries do not produce enough food for their own needs, which makes them more vulnerable to different crises. So this current situation showed that it's necessary to revitalize domestic production and to encourage the short food supply chains. Our goal is to support the development of the holistic approach to the content and methods of advisory services in crisis situations, which encompass the regional and social characteristics in Southeastern Europe. Considering the motive for creating this webinar, our key plan concrete activities are based on recognizing that the impact of COVID-19 and response measures are not uniform across the globe. We are also developing a realization of an executive summary in FAO study on the topic of assessment of the human capacity development needs for and gaps in the agricultural advisory services in Western Balkans from 2011. Development and enlarging of the season application for the project Digital Interrogation Network for Agricultural Households and Small Farms at the regional level to cope with disruptive events. 
Thank you for your attention. And the on the following links, you can find more details about our project. Thank you, thank you a lot. And now uh, I would like to invite uh, Botir Dosov, uh, the uh, chairperson of the Caucasus and Central Asia Forum for Rural Advisory uh, Services. Over to you, thank you. Good morning, dear participants. Central Asia and the Caucasus Forum for Rural Advisory Services, CACFRAS, was formalized in 2018 as a regional NGO with office in Bishkek, Kyrgyz Republic. CACFRAS serves as a platform for bringing together different stakeholders to provide assistance and technical leadership on rural advisory services in accordance with the regional and national development priorities. Lockdown at national scale at COVID-19 quarantine measures have affected the advisory services in the region. Many of them took some time to reorient and diversify the delivery channels as online services and consultancies, physically present consultancies keeping the COVID-19 protecting rules and combination of online and face-to-face -face consultancies. So during this challenging period, the efficiency and effectiveness of rural advisory services are quite different across the different sectors. Part of them cannot do much and more. Others are trying to adapt to the situation and move their consultations online. There are a third part that goes beyond adaptation and tries to innovate in response to particular needs and constraints of the farmers and enter into new roles. So the big question is why some of them are more proactive and innovative while others are still facing their challenges. The answer is going beyond the COVID-19 context. Main clients of and or beneficiaries of advisory services in the region are small and medium scale farmers, small and medium scale rural entrepreneurs, new agriculture and rural business startups, medium and large scale farms and agribusinesses. What are the types of advisory services in the region? We have existing networks of quasi-extension advisory services under the ministries and agencies operating in national agri-food system. NGOs providing advisory services and private companies promoting their products for farmers. So sometimes they initiate narrow and time-bound public-private partnerships with government networks. Donors organizations support NGOs providing advisory services through their projects, which are not sustainable in long term. In fact, we can say that advisory services in the region are pluralistic. However, existing advisory services are still fragmented. The linkages between advisory services providers and other agriculture innovation system actors are not well established. Therefore, advisory service providers definitely need to be evolved to be more sustainable and well-functioning. This, first of all, requires enhancing capacities and resilience of extension advisory services, learning lessons and capitalize the experience, especially from COVID-19 period and situation. Fortunately, for the learning how to capitalize on experience, we should not invent the wheel. FAO, with support of many development agencies, has developed e-learning course on experience capitalization. Also, Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services, GFRAS, and FAO have launched the online course on experience capitalization for Europe and Central Asia in, in English and Russian languages to support the European Union Forum for Rural Advisory Services, UFRAS, and CACFRAS to enhance capacities in resilience of advisory services, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic and post-pandemic period. For those who are not aware of this, please contact me or Ms. Sophie Trenin to join the course. I wish you all learning from the experience to be better prepared for the future challenges and improve the livelihoods of farmers through better advisory services. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Bati. Uh, now I'm afraid that we have to um, accelerate a little bit because we are over time. But I can see that the discussion is very lively and uh, I also saw that the panelists were addressing the questions directly in the chat and the Q&A box as we, as we speak. So I encourage the panelists to continue doing so. 
Uh, well, I would like to invite uh, Selva Rajaramasani, the head of the uh, Research and Extension Unit, AGDR in FAO, to give us uh, closing remarks and also um, some uh, the most important home take messages. Thank you. Over to you, Selva Raju. Yeah. Thank you, Sophia, and uh, thank you all presenters and also participants for this active engagement in this webinar. Just I would like to quickly go through the summary uh, from this webinar, as well as some key take home messages uh, so that it can be useful for all of us. As we all know, COVID-19 challenges are many and the impacts are not uh, uniform. Challenges vary from country to country, and this is not only related to access to technology, but also other services, such as uh, storage, transportation problems, extension services. Um, but in spite of all these things, extension services are affected by restricted mobility. Impacts on large uh, retailers, decrease in demand due to impact on economy, uh, or evidence during these presentations. Lack of employment, labor access, and difficulty in financial sectors were also, was also highlighted. Um, extension and advisory services are in the front line of response during this pandemic, and also in the post pandemic uh, that we expect that EAS actors can have a very significant role. But however, integration of uh, extension and advisory services with the area, various existing networks is very critical, which was uh, highlighted uh, from our colleague from uh, European Commission. But the investment is also very important because EAS uh, systems are highly fragmented. So integration is very, very critical, but with uh, the necessary investment. There are opportunities to expand the services by making use of existing EAS actors. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. The system is in place in many countries, but uh, highlighting the need for a reform, taking into consideration of pluralism, demand drivenness, and also market oriented services is, uh, is critical. Role of uh, EAS, in value chain development is uh, prominent, which was highlighted by almost all the speakers, but need to have necessary data. Connecting farmers and consumers is critical. This also needs ensuring storage, transport and processing to facilitate uh, this connection. Extension and advisory services are increasingly depending on online resources especially during this pandemic where we need to maintain the physical uh, distancing. They need to adapt to the available services, especially the digital platforms to reach out to the farmers is still possible and can help better understand the impacts and also better identify the needs and the prioritization of the responses. The most important part that was highlighted from several country experiences is the strengthening the local systems. Um, this is a kind of a missing link, uh, how to strengthen the local systems, better connection with the national systems and also the regional system is very, very important. This is to ensure better inclusion of most vulnerable farmers, including smallholders. Cooperatives, also provide necessary services to the farmers. We have seen one of the examples, one of the presenters uh, offered this particular example. They, they are also valuable actors and uh, they can uh, provide the timely information uh, to, the, to the farmers. Consultation and field work can also complement these services, but with the necessary physical distancing and also uh, protective equipments. Quality of services, including information is very important to avoid potential distortion and also to ensure build mutual trust between the information providers and users. And users in this case are several intermediaries, business enterprises, and also the farmers. 
multi-actor approach, the need for multi-actor approach was highlighted. Multi-actor approach for innovation, SCAR, ACIS should be embedded in policy and practices. Agriculture is becoming more knowledge intensive and multi-actor networks are very, very critical. Role of uh, regional networks, public-private partnerships are very important to ensure sustainability and well-functioning systems at all levels, including regional, sub-regional, and also national level. And there was a very, very clear example that was provided uh, with uh, the Southeast European Advisory Service Network based on their experience. Experience capitalization is critical to enhance the capacity and resilience of advisory services. And not only the advisory services, the uh, parallel exchange of information at the very local level among the farmers is also critical. And this experience capitalization and the sharing of information uh, that, can, that can facilitate this process. I think with this uh, summary and the key messages, I close this uh, webinar. And I thank all presenters for, in, for sharing your experiences and, uh, for, and uh, the participants for active contribution to the discussions. I thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Sophia. Thank you. I also join Selva in thanking very much uh, all the participants, all the panelists, but also all the organizers and um, technical and communication team who worked very uh, hard behind the scenes to, uh, to make this webinar happen. And um, as again, I said, uh, we are sorry that uh, we don't have more time for the uh, Q&A, but Yang uh, can share his screen with a summary of some main, uh, let's say, discussion threads in, in the chat. Well, I would just like to share some uh, organizational announcements. So as said previously in the chat, we'll be sharing with all the registered users uh, the presentations as well as the recording of this webinar. And also uh, stay tuned because we will be sharing very soon um, the announcement of the next webinar on a similar topic, but focused on another region. Probably we'll go uh, with Africa, but uh, this uh, needs to be seen yet. Uh, so stay tuned and most importantly, uh, stay uh, safe and look at the uh, summary of the questions and discussion on the screen. Thank you so much again to everyone. Thank you, thank you very much. This is the key, point, key points from the participants. We will also share this summary uh, so that you can have an overview together with other materials from the webinar. <laughs>